So I'm over at my buddy's house the other day and he's building up his uh, 61 Caddy. It's all bagged out, thing weighs as much as a house and uh, the previous builder on it didn't do the most satisfactory job. I mean, uh, this uh, arm's looking a little dated and not to mention we have some geometry that we have to correct on it. So since the original design used shims that are a little bit dated, um, you know, we gotta, we gotta fix this. So that presents the perfect opportunity for me to get in here, start up a video and say, here's how to build some extra big ass four links. Now equipped with more molecules. Now I'm definitely not going to call this a hack job or anything like that. I mean, we all start somewhere, right? So we need to correct some of this stuff. I don't really care for this bag mount, the way it's sitting on there. You can tell the arm is pretty twisted up or this lower link, a little messed up. But yeah, we'll, uh, we gotta fix this. It's just, it's just not enough. So some things you need to pay attention to. When it gets dropped off, it may have two different size bolts like this one. One side is a 9 16 while the other side is a 5 8 Now I don't know if that was from the factory or not, but that's what came off the car and that means that's what the chassis has in it. Those are the size holes. So these poly bushings, they're obviously, you know, we're not gonna keep these. They're just, they're whatever. So we need to make a jig. In order to make a jig, we're just gonna take a couple of bolts, the correct size bolts. One of them a 5 8 the other one a 9 16 and I'm going to remove the zinc coating or grind it off of just two sides. It doesn't need to be, you know, super heavy duty or anything like that. It just, just enough to basically hold the place and that's all a jig does. Once I have the zinc removed, we're going to face it off in the, uh, in the lathe. Now, not a necessary step. If you don't have a lathe or you can't do this, don't worry about it. All this is doing for me is basically giving me a nice flat and even surface in which to uh, mount or weld all of this on the uh, on the jig. Now a lot of people overcomplicate jigs. I don't really know why, but just think very simple. All it is is a placeholder, nothing more. That's why we only need just a couple of spots to uh, weld on these bolts, right? Nothing fancy at all. So I'm gonna tack it on there, one tack on each side, and that's just enough to uh, hold it in place and you know kind of help minimize distortion while it holds the place of where the new pieces and parts need to be when I make this. Now we can't weld it fully, otherwise we're going to melt away on those poly uh, bushings there, and that's just you know that's kind of cheesy. So remove it after tacking and fully weld each side. This is more than enough to hold it in place. Now this jig is nothing more than some like believe one by two rectangle tubing with an eighth inch wall. That's more than sufficient, just as long as it holds everything in place. So as soon as we have all the bolts welded, let's move on. So I'm going to start with the ends. Now the ends are going to be basically standardized. Now before we had two different size bushings and two different size bolts that went in there. And that's kind of a pain in the butt if you ever need to replace anything. So if we standardize them and make them out of the same uh, size bushing and same size housing for that bushing, the only thing that changes is the size of the pin in the center of it that holds the bolt. So we're going to start with some two inch OD DOM tubing with a quarter inch wall. This is some big heavy duty stuff. Now as most DOM has it, there is a mill scale that's on the outside of it, which means that has to be removed. The fastest and smoothest way I found to remove it is to chuck it up into the lathe, spin it with some emery cloth, and then polish it up with a uh, piece of scotch brite or a, a surface prep pad. Now this is going to get it perfectly ready to weld uh, nice and clean everything that I want. Now we need some solid clean metal on here to get some solid clean welds out of it. So this is a step you definitely don't want to uh, skip over. Now if you don't have a lathe or any way to spin it around, you can uh, definitely uh, use some, uh, basically some surface prep pads on grinding wheels or anything of uh, the similar, the like. You know, you can do it all by hand. Uh, the lathe just makes it go a little bit quicker. Now these are my poly bushings right here. I'm gonna go ahead and take a measurement of these. Can they, like I said, they're gonna be standardized. So four pieces to build two links, one on each side, two and a half inches is the measurement. And the bandsaw is what's going to get it cut to length. Now, if I wanted to be all fancy, I could spin this out in the lathe, but realistically speaking, the bandsaw will do the job just fine. Just slice all of these out four pieces, and then we can move on to what's next. Now, since polyurethane is our bushing material, we know that earlier, since we tried to tack it up with, you know, in the jig there, it started smoking one of them out, and we don't want to melt it, so we definitely can't use polyurethane bushings in the actual uh, bushing ends while we're welding it, otherwise they're just going to melt. So there are companies that make and sell uh, bushing dummies, uh, basically a solid aluminum bushings that will hold the place of the, uh, the ends, or the four-link ends, or the bushing ends, or the housings, uh, while you weld it, right? Now, I'm not going to buy those 
windows since I have a lathe and it gives me an opportunity to show you guys you know how it's done so I'm gonna start with some two inch solid bar stock now this is all just nothing more than just some aluminum right nothing fancy I'm gonna chuck it up into the lathe I'm gonna face it off first that way I have a nice clean surface to work on pop a hole right in the middle of it this will be the size of our bolt then I'm gonna go ahead and start cutting it down now when I cut it down to a size all I'm doing is just cutting out a shoulder and making sure that the top end of the bushing now the top where the shoulder is or the top that's gonna sit around the outside of the tubing that has to be basically standard and I'm gonna cut that to length at a quarter inch actually just a little bit more so that way when I take it out of there and we you know after it's already cut I'm gonna flip it around and I'm gonna face off the front of it and make sure it comes down to exactly a quarter inch tall that means that we won't have any kind of miscrepancy or uh, misalignment with our bushings now if you don't have these there are alternative solutions those solutions might be using solid bar stock um, for the ID of the uh, tubing that you're using on the bushing ends uh, you know you can use that you can use a stack of washers welded together or something or basically anything that holds that place uh, will do the trick now I know I just kind of flew right through that machining, but uh, you know it's 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 really simple. It was just to show you guys kind of how it works or how they're made or how you could do it too. So with all of that done, we can slide the dummy bushings into the housings, get them all fitted up to the jig, and we can start measuring for our four link. Adjustability is definitely one of those things that I want to incorporate into this because the original system on the Cadillac itself used these really funny looking four bolt uh, shims, which I don't even know if you can get those anymore, but who cares? We can, <laughs> we can completely eliminate them and basically standardize everything like we are with everything else. So this gigantic inch and an eighth pin is uh, what we're going to use for adjustment. Now, you have to measure out your usable threads on this. And uh, in this case, when I measure them out, it comes out to about an inch or so of usable threads, so I want to make sure that the jam nut is uh, basically up against the uh, the, the uh, housing there, that, that uh, bushing there. I want it to be at exactly one inch, so that way we have the same amount of inward uh, and outward movement, and uh, it still maintains some strength at the standard number, or at the, uh, the basically at the point where it is uh, at factory length. So. Now there's a lot of math that goes into uh, deciding how thick or how big your links need to be, uh, and I'm not going to get too far into that. You kind of have to know how much you know ultimate strength they have, tensile strength, yield strength, all the rest of that. Uh, combined with the ratios of how your setup is and all the rest, of that, that's a totally different topic. But I'm using quarter inch wall square tubing because it's more than strong enough, and of course this giant pin and everything else like that. This bushing goes into it. So with a quarter inch wall bushing, we need a lot of area to weld. So that bushing bushing is not going to slip right in the end of the tube, it's actually going to protrude a little bit, so I'm going to stick it out about a half of an inch. Now I'm going to measure from the inside of the bushing housing to that mark that I just threw down on the actual pin bushing. Now this is going to give me a general ballpark reference of what I need to cut my square tubing to. Now my tubing of choice, 2x2 two two square tubing with a quarter inch wall. This is some heavy duty stuff, usually what they make uh, trailer receiver hitches and stuff like that out of. This is uh, this will definitely do the job and uh, of course I backed it up with the math to uh, calculate all that. Now just slicing it down to the bandsaw and then we have to notch out one side. Now since our bushing housings are round and our four link material is square, that means we need to cut a round notch into the square side. Now it's uh, really not rocket science, a hole saw will do the job, just like it will with many other notching methods or different shapes and such. Now this I'm just going to chuck it up into the mill, that way I get it all nice and squared and set up exactly where I need to. My cut can be measured and placed right down the middle exactly where I want it to be. It's very very simple. Now there's a bunch of different methods you can use here, you can actually uh, put a little center hole into it and uh, use a hand drill to uh, you know chop its way down through there you can uh, grab a hold of uh, a tubing notcher one of my favorites is the uh, rogue fabrication versa notcher that thing is really awesome it'll it'll buy it'll uh, notch out some square tube as well but really nothing all that fancy now just remember that virtually every single hole saw has its limitations and that limitation on this one is less than two inches so I obviously have to uh, you know take this back out of there remove that other piece so I can finish off the notch all from one side otherwise I'd have to flip it over and try to line it up again. Not going to happen, but pretty simple. We just get it all notched out and then I'm going to chase it out with the grinder. Now being that this is a quarter of an inch thick, we're going to pretty much be struggling if we tried to nail it all in one single pass. I mean, we're talking, we'd have to have a ton of amperage 
and we'd have to fly right through it. And, you know, there's, there's a possibility that it might not come out just right. Instead, I want to increase the surface area of the weld. That means that I'm going to knock a big old fat gnarly bevel into this, and we're going to run multi-pass welds on it. The first weld is going to go right down into the root, give us our good solid fusion, which I can run nice and slow with. And the second will be the cap to fill it all in. And also with this bevel on here, we're actually increasing the surface area. So the uh, amount that I'm cutting out, about an eighth inch. There's an eighth inch land on it, or an eighth of an inch, or about half of the tubing that is not ground away. The other is ground about 45 degrees or so back. This effectively increases our surface area, giving the weld more to bite onto. Now forget about measuring this, uh, you know, to length, trying to figure out wh how long the four-link bar needs to be. Here's a cool little trick. Earlier we marked out the amount of protrusion that we want for the actual uh, bushing, for the where the pin bushing goes into. We marked out the amount of protrusion that we want out of it. So place that over the top while everything is in the jig and translate that line right down onto the actual tubing itself. That line will be the correct length that you need to chop this down to in order to make all of it fit. It'll work the exact same way every single time because you're using a jig. Now just like before, we're going to clean this up with a grinder. I'm going to face it off with the grinder so that way it's nice, clean, bright metal. Everything is nice and prepped. And I'm also going to add a bevel to it. The same bevel is going to go onto it, about an eighth of an inch land, roughly 45 degrees beveled back. Then I'm going to clean up everything around it, all the edges. Now even though we're not welding like the actual sides of the tube itself or welding the end of it, I'm still going to clean it up just in case something changes or, you know, plans change, whatever. I want nice, clean, bright metal metal. So now it's time for everybody's favorite part, including mine, and that is the welding. So I'm going to get this fixed in the jig. Now notice I have some spacers at the bottom that keep it in place, aligned right down the center where it needs to be. That's extremely important because you don't want this thing to be all crooked or anything like that. I mean, take a couple extra steps, measure it out, make sure it's dead center. Now as far as tacking this together or welding it in the jig, we want to have at least three tacks holding it together. Usually I say tack in quadrants, which is four tacks spaced evenly apart, but since I can't access the bottom of the jig, three tacks will do. Three tacks will keep it nice and solid. Now all of my root passes with as much as I can do are going to be while it's in the jig. And of course this area where we have the bung that goes into the square side, unfortunately the manufacturer, whoever made this thing, didn't make it big enough to go into there. So we're going to have to deal with those holes a little bit later. And it's not like they're difficult to do, I just wish they, you know, wouldn't have cut those corners so short. I should have just made one instead of bought one, but whatever. Anyway, back to the welding here. All root passes, once again, or at least as much as I can cover, is going to be done in the jig. Currently, the welder is set up to, I believe, 165, maybe 170 amps. I honestly can't remember where I had it at. It was a little on the higher side. My welder filler rod uh, is uh, ER70S-2, and I'm using 045. That's, uh, I think, like 1.1 millimeter or so. It's very small stuff. Now, you would think that you got to, you know, throw in a ton here uh, in order to get this in there, but it's actually the opposite. I want um, to add more filler wire to my weld pool to establish the bead, and I want the control over it. So we have to do that with smaller filler wire, not necessarily larger. So we can always add more from a smaller uh, filler rod, but we can't always add less from a larger one. So 045 filler wire, and we're just really pushing it in there, making sure it all wets in and blends and bleeds to uh, both the sides of the land and, uh, of course, onto the actual uh, bushing housing itself. Making sure it stays nice and tight, and I mean super tight. I am full throttle the entire way through. So with all the roots done, or at least as many as I can do, while it's in the jig, I'm going to let it cool down for a few minutes, and then I can pull it out of the jig and then finish off the root passes on the, uh, on the you know, three spots where I couldn't get them before. So that's at this end with the bushing housing. And then I'm also going to do the pin one more time. And uh, I don't believe I showed it on this one, but uh, I also did that other section where the, uh, the bung goes in. Now, speaking of that bung, this is that big pesky gap we get to deal with. Now, I use the same amount of amperage again, except this time I've increased my filler rod diameter to 2.4 millimeter or 332nd. Now, this, I'm just going to run just a little bead over the bottom of it and then force feed some filler wire up to bleed it up into the top or blend it up into the top. Now, I only got that one arc shot out of it. Unfortunately, I was a little too uncomfortable, and this is a you know critical weld, but if you watch my hand, I weave it uh, to get it to fill and blend in. Now, we're going to have to rely a lot more on the cap to uh, maintain most of that structure. I mean, there's a lot of good amount in the, uh, the actual root, but the cap is going to really uh, dial that one in or polish it off. Now, speaking of caps, 
I'm going to weave. Now, at least on this bushing end here, on the bushing housing, I'm going to weave on the flat sections of it. But on the radius section, there's not enough room or any need to weave it. Uh, instead, I just uh, upped my filler rod diameter to 1 16th uh, and uh, filled it just very heavy. I did not do anything with the amperage. I'm still about 165, 170 amps full throttle, but I did allow the piece to cool about 20 minutes before I went into uh, doing the caps on it. Now this weave, it's just back and forth to push and blend it and make sure that we have enough uh, weld or enough filler basically to uh, bridge that gap, make it nice, flat, and even. I could have run two or three passes on this or whatever, you know, I mean, whoopity do. But the weave just, aside from, you know, being, you know, having the strength and everything else like that, it's just, I, I just kind of want it to look pretty, you know, <laughs> and you get a chance to show it off for those who are actually looking. And once again, going around the radius, just, you know, nice big old fat stacks, making sure it blends and bleeds and wets in into uh, both the face of the tube and the uh, this section of the radius. Now, finally is the pin. Now this, you know, that 045, wire is very tight and I trust that it was just fine but again we need a uh, big fat heavy uh, amperage on here and we're gonna throw down a big old giant uh, big old giant bead um, it, it's on this one it's kind of hard to tell where it wets in or anything like that but as long as it extends past and it, it covers every section the way it's supposed to we're good we're solid that's really all I need but one thing I'm going to point out extremely important here I did not start or terminate any of those cap beads where the uh, original root bead uh, started or terminated. We did not do any of that. We made sure that we actually welded over those and all of my start and stop areas on the uh, the cap pass were done while they were uh, the, while we were in between all the start stops on the route. So very important that you do that. Now once we have both of them completely welded we can set it up right next to the original one and you can see what a massive difference this makes. Now I do have to build some bag brackets and I'll put those on at a later date when I can actually measure them out on the chassis but this is pretty stout. Now here's the fun part. I still got to build this upper. Now this is uh, this is going to be interesting because it's not really like I can take a bunch of off-the-shelf parts and make it all happen. And uh, yeah, we still have some of that corrective geometry we got to work with. So that's going to come up in a future episode, and it also involves somebody else helping me out on the machining end of things. So we'll have more updates as they come. But that is going to wrap it up for this episode. And I want to thank you guys for watching. As always, make sure you subscribe and you ring that bell. Now, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and drop them down in the comments box below. If you need to get in touch with us, you can always hit us up on the fabricationseries.com website, Instagram at the.fabricator, or Facebook.com slash the fabricator series. I'll see you guys on the next episode. I like money.